Now, Margaret and I are going to present to you some um, findings that we had from a research project that we conducted with Abby McDonald, who's one of our other co-conveners for the Australian Association of Research and Education, um, the Arts Education Research and Practice um, SIG. So um, what we decided to do was find out exactly what was happening in the universities across Australia in terms of what um, arts education offerings were happening. So we realised that there is a lot of research that, that Margaret mentioned before that promote the value of the arts, and, but we kind of figured that maybe there's not a, enough happening in teacher education courses and as um, Margaret mentioned too, some primary education students, for example, in Australia get six hours of arts education and are expected to teach the arts in schools. So it is a very timely national snapshot for us in Australia because of the impending national curriculum. Um, and what we decided to do was contact a number of arts educators, educators across the country and every one of them agreed to participate. We interviewed them, one from each state and territory. And we also managed to get quite a sweep across the arts forms. So we've got some music educators, drama, media arts, visual arts and dance. And the three of us also as arts educators decided to write our own story about what we were experiencing in our own universities as well. So we have um, embedded the th um, theoretical approach of narrative inquiry in our research. So Margaret and I are actually going to read our narratives for you today. So as I said, we had um, eight people participate, interview plus the three of us. And through the interviews and our own narratives, we identified the three themes listed there. So we noted that um, arts educators were very diverse people. And they not only taught arts education in the um, higher education sector, um, change was very much a, a big theme where not only were there changes happening with our courses but the, what were expected of us, certainly funding was an issue and therefore advocacy was a, a big topic as well. So what Margaret and I will do now is actually read through our narratives for you focusing on those three areas and the first is diversity. So the interviews revealed that each participant had wide-ranging teaching experiences across primary and secondary schools. They also commented on the diverse range of courses and programs they taught in the tertiary sector. These included courses such as educational leadership and management, curriculum and assessment, creativity, pedagogical practice, sociology of education, inclusivity and literacy. Georgina revealed how Having a wide range of teaching experience in diverse contexts has enabled me to understand difference and has definitely impacted on my teaching approach. However, it has also made it difficult for me to concentrate on one aspect of my work. We considered our own and the participants' ability to adapt to our respective universities' needs as both a positive and a negative. It appeared to confirm the value placed on the arts in relation to how the arts foster creative and lateral thinkers who are also resilient and able to adapt to new situations. However, it also suggests that with increased regulation, there has been a decrease in autonomy and possibly work satisfaction across a range of professions, <coughs> resulting in, for example, arts academics being utilised to teach and coordinate across subjects they were not originally trained for. Margaret revealed that... I embed arts approaches in other courses I am teaching, using strategies such as visual literacy to interrogate axes of identity, exploring the philosophical basis of the arts through alternative approaches to schooling, and ensuring students are aware of arts-based approaches in research methodology. Greenwood and Hidings note that organisational change and the ability to adapt has increased since the early 1990s, largely due to the complexity of political, regulatory and technological changes that increasingly confronts organisations. It was also evident that the diverse schools each participant had acquired throughout their professional career were paramount to their commitment to education generally. This enabled them all to have had some experience in curriculum development at either the state 
<coughs> or territory and or federal level in Australia. Due to their years of teaching, both Georgina and Margaret had written curriculum documents for accreditation and had been part of this process. As the co-conveners of the Arts Education Practice and Research SIG, affiliated with AARE, the authors have also provided feedback on the draft proposal of the curriculum, of the Australian curriculum, the arts. I try and encourage them, the students, to see the curriculum as an enabling document. So again, even though I haven't oh. seen it, I'm trying to put a kind of spin on the glass half full rather than half empty in terms of how they're going to encounter that curriculum and their needs oh. to implement it. I often say to students that they're going to be pioneers of this work and that they need a really good understanding and an integrated understanding of the value of arts education in school and in the value of how you approach arts education within the curriculum so that they can be the ones to carry that curriculum. And that's from Natalie. And then from Mary, I have an attitude that once students know how to use curriculum in regards to outcomes and then using those outcomes and working through a sequence, then it doesn't matter what curriculum document we are using. My philosophy is, if you can teach, you can teach. And it's a matter of what documents you use at the time. If they move to another country, they'll have to pick up another curriculum document. So as we read these extracts, we were reminded of how people are drawn to the arts are actually adept at finding more than one solution to a problem. And they often are chosen to take leadership and convening roles, which in fact was a common experience across all respondents. At times, this was necessary, particularly for those who are the only arts lecture lecturer at their institution. Georgina proposed that as a result of the curriculum changes she had experienced that... This has impacted on the way that I present information to my pre-service teachers, explaining that what matters is what they do in the classroom. While there are many changes that happen in their careers, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Artists tend to manage and deal with change well. For the participants in less urbanised areas, they were jacks of all trades and often graciously accepted roles that may not have been in their specialised or preferred areas. And this is from Beth. I definitely have a very heavy coordination, oh, sorry, coordination role of all the arts areas because I'm the only arts lecturer at the university. Similarly, their counterparts in larger cities had experience across a number of roles and courses. Well, I was given a course which was very dull, called Administration, Management, Leadership and Change in Early Childhood, which was very theoretical. I was given the task of making it more community-based, so we embarked on a range of projects, including arts projects with a local theatre company, and design students worked with the early childhood students. That course has now morphed into two courses. One's called Curriculum Leadership and Advocacy, which I've taught where students go out and do practice-based work in the community and often arts-based work as well. We link them with artists in the community. The other course is called Literacies Across the Early Childhood Curriculum, which I'm coordinating this semester. I've done that twice now, which is a multi-literacies approach to the curriculum. And that's from Kevin. The arts educators described how they had faced many challenges and difficulties throughout their professional careers. These usually occurred around the time of curriculum or managerial change. Abby acknowledges that although she has limited time in the tertiary sector... From my neophyte teacher educator perspective, I sense frustration amongst my arts colleagues, particularly from those who I have who I know have fought and are still fighting a seemingly endless battle to justify the value, power and place of the arts within education contexts. It was evident that each person, however, was able to face these times of uncertainty with a positive attitude. We considered that although this is often seen as a strength, it may have also impacted on how the arts have been treated, such as being integrated with other areas and or offered online without critical debate regarding the consequences of such an approach. As Abby revealed... This reconceptualisation of what we can offer to those teachers wishing to specialise in the arts at our university is in both response and reaction. Response to an understanding of the need to not privilege any of the five key arts areas over another and reaction to an impending sink or swim ultimatum from the university for all specialisations with unsustainable student numbers. 
It was clear that due to the fact that they had experienced in a number of diverse areas, this equipped them with necessary skills to assist them to accept this change. The feeling of frustration, however, was evident and therefore much of the talk and the interviews focused on both change and advocacy for the arts. And the second theme is change. I might just explain, we usually do this with Abby, so mm. <laughs> that's why I'm saying Georgina's part. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so change. In <coughs> Australia, there is a great deal of change occurring in the education sector, such as the staggered rollout of the national curriculum and funding cuts to institutions such as schools and universities due to a range of factors, including the global financial crisis. Institutional income has decreased as a result of lower than expected student numbers, particularly in the area of international students, and also due to increasing globalisation of university courses in a competitive global market. The interviews revealed that these are all very real issues for each of the tertiary arts educators, with a number of the respondents linking this decrease in funding to reduced arts offerings. So Susan said there's not any resourcing at the tertiary level so that our students can be better equipped to use the arts across the curriculum. But I think that's part and parcel of the whole current tertiary climate. I mean the resourcing in the tertiary area is almost non-existent. It's dismal, it really is dismal the provision. We, were, we kind of were on the edge of having two arts courses last year so we were on the edge of it but we didn't get it because of the literacy and numeracy thrust. That's why we've kind of lost time in the arts. They got at least 16 hours of face-to-face -face contact with an assessment in each of the arts, whereas now we can't do that. We just don't have the time. Kevin. Our narrative accounts also reveal the experiences at our respective university universities resonated with the participants' data. Margaret described described how after taking up a new position at a university that... I was soon to discover the plethora of arts courses were to be taught out during that year as the university had been undergoing consolidation of courses in order to increase efficiency and cost effectiveness. Georgina explained that... Eight years ago, the music specialisation students at my current institution undertook two music courses each semester. Now they do one. Abby's experience of the reduction of arts courses was similar, however she also argued that The arts are by no means the only area under threat in this situation. Other specialisations such as outdoor education and design and technology are also feeling the heavy gaze of critical eyes due to a decline in student numbers. Abby also revealed her experience of teaching into a nine-week Introduction to the Arts Intensive Unit for Masters of Teaching Primary Specialisation students. Which constituted the entirety of their exposure to the arts across two years of their degree. But when faced with this or nothing at all, you do your best to make it as worthwhile as possible. The participants also acknowledged that due to cuts in teacher education programs, it was inevitable that children in schools will suffer by not having access to quality arts education. Beth said that the climate I think is quite dire and I think if it continues to go this way we will continue to have these problems if not worse because the students that come in through different education systems will have even less literacy in the arts. Despite comments such as these, the respondents were hopeful that things may improve. They acknowledge the many benefits that the arts have to offer and believe that every now and then this is valued by people in positions that matter. One of the things that really was interesting was just the explosion of interest at a tertiary level in creative practice. So in the last 10 years there's been an increase in the number of creative PhDs by creative practice. There's been a real change, I think, in the way that the arts are engaged or the way that the arts find themselves in the tertiary sector in arts faculties and creative arts faculties or creative industries across the country. That's from Natalie. And Nathan said, I just keep thinking there must be a paper in there somewhere that now the big boys and girls in education, meaning those that matter, are talking about it. People actually want to listen. <coughs> So it seems that while the arts have experienced decreased hours in teacher education courses, there is evidence that the arts are valued, albeit in different contexts. Research pertaining to the arts and arts practice has increased, although this could be related to the recent Excellence in Research in Australia initiative, which was 2009, which broadened the definition of research to make provisions for artistic research, practice-led and practice-based research. As the Australian curriculum, the arts is, well, very close, we hope. Um, 
The arts educators based their opinions on this implementation on previous experience with curriculum change. They felt that unless there was strong awareness of the plight of the arts and therefore a conscious effort made to ensure quality arts education in schools, then arts education practice may lack rigour and depth. Those qualified in the arts and with training across a range of studio disciplines should be able to draw upon this previous expertise to alleviate potential shortcomings in their teaching preparation courses, more for secondary really. Margaret noted that this is what occurred during her first years of teaching as her confidence grew, I was able to develop an emerging identity as a teacher that drew upon my strengths, suited my personality and contributed to an understanding and appreciation of the arts with the students I was teaching. However, although it would be expected that secondary art teachers would have a foundation in their studio discipline areas, <coughs> most generalist primary teachers would not. Therefore, the importance of quality arts education at the tertiary level is critical in ensuring that the arts are valued in the school context. So we keep going? Or, uh, we have enough time? Yes. Yeah, we do. <laughs> As we considered the participants' transcripts, it became clear that advocacy for the arts, such as through the creation of partnerships, was a very strong theme. Georgina revealed how her university was visited by Aboriginal women from the Central Desert. The opportunity to work and interact with these women was special, not only for me, but also the students. The ways in which the women performed and interacted with us was unique and powerful. For many undergraduate students, the informal and oral mode of learning had not been experienced before and the immersion into these ways of knowing expanded their views of music and music teaching. It is evident that reduction in time for the arts is also impacting on opportunities to develop partnerships within allocated university time. And often these were sought as extracurricular activities for the students as value adding to their qualifications. It was also clear that the participants were acutely aware of the substantial research documenting the value of the arts, yet it appeared that this needed to be constantly reinforced to those making decisions about time allocation and funding. It's just frustrating, but you would know as an art teacher that's what you have to deal with all the time. It's a justification for why we exist, and I don't know if you could say that about some other areas. Beth. And then Susan said, I don't think there's enough realisation of how important the arts are. I mean, I think we've got a strong arts team here, but I think there are probably lots of people who think there are more important areas. Abby's narrative account perceptively argued that it is difficult to justify the arts in a tertiary education program. When the tertiary context cannot even afford to give all five arts equal and reasonable representation within their pre-service teaching program, justifying the value and significance of the arts to my students when it is glaringly obvious how little they feature across the four years of their pre-service teacher training is an ongoing challenge. The arts have experienced a major decrease in the tertiary sector. This has impacted on the arts educator's role with many seeking new ways to increase, increase the visibility of the arts in their own institution. I do workshops for parents. I do a lot of work in schools alongside teachers who are interested in looking at what's possible. Susan. And then Kevin said, I started using the arts as a tool for learning really and a way of engaging very disadvantaged kids. I was their outreach manager, so we brokered a partnership with the Department of Education and Training. I've always been interested in that kind of power of the arts to engage kids who are not engaging with school. Building positive relationships with outside organisations was evident in each of the interviews. Developing partnerships with art galleries, music organisations, orchestras and theatre companies were all highlighted. The interviewees noted that these connections for their pre-service teachers were perhaps the most profound learning experiences they encountered throughout their study. There's a lot of things I do as part of my course, which are almost seen as extracurricular activities, but they definitely raise the profile of the arts. I mean, people who are in third year said this was the most powerful and interesting thing they've done in three years of university. That was Beth. While the respondents intimated that all arts educators are aware of these impacts, it was others in leadership positions that still need to be made aware. The importance of advocacy is a real issue, although there was a feeling that the arts educators were sick of having to constantly justify the benefits of the arts. Ultimately, they just want to get on with their job, but unfortunately the lack of understanding from people in management positions and across the education sector generally means that advocacy is necessary in order for the arts to survive. 
Waples and Friedrich reveal that the greatest impact on creativity is having autonomy in relation to the way people conduct their work, resulting in increasing motivation which is essential to creative performance. This sense of autonomy for tertiary arts educators is being impacted by increasing accountability, corporatisation evident in higher education, which is now commonly using terms such as benchmarking marking and outputs. So, what we um, came up with from the research are a number of recommendations that we would like um, people to recognise and actually start to embed in their practice. And the first one is... In oh, recommendation one, enhance recognition that the arts offer many benefits to education and to acknowledge and promote the value of the arts to learning. Two was to encourage integration of the goals of the sole agenda that Margaret mentioned at the beginning in Australian tertiary education practices. Three, expand professional development opportunities for arts educators. Four is to acknowledge and promote the inherent characteristics of arts educators. Five, lobby state and territory and federal government to recognise the importance of the arts in education. And the final is to support increasing partnerships of the tertiary sector with local, national and international arts organisations. Um, and the three of us have actually had a paper now accepted into the Australian Journal of Teacher Education, which you can access online. It's published, <laughs> yes. So um, that reports on the, the research project for you.